a second for this bar to finish. Setting up. If we can, if we can stop about 145, that would help me too. That's perfect. All right. So we are now live on YouTube for Around the League. This is our uh, podcast from UGASports.com where we chat about uh, what's going on in the SEC and uh, just all over the conference. And so let's jump right into this, guys. And, and we do this every week where we kind of take inventory of our picks last week and our bold predictions. And congratulations to all three of us for going 3-0 and with the same picks of Georgia, Auburn, and Kentucky, although Coach Auburn barely got that win for us. Yeah, I guarantee you Auburn's uh, got to be thanking their lucky stars a lot of places, you know, the Kentucky game and uh, this game. But, hey, any way you can get to W, you got to take it. And uh, I fought Arkansas a little bit, as much as I respect Coach Pittman and the job he's done. And uh, the offensive coordinator, Kendall Bryles, there at the end of the game when all he had to do was make one first down. It's hard, hard to make a first down. I know when other teams trying to stop the clock and all, but just horrific play calling there those last three plays where they had then they had to punt I mean you've torched that team the whole second half you've sold your kids you know, and you're going to try to win the game and then you go out and call plays like that it was just uh I mean it really chapped me because I wanted Sam to win so badly but you know he had to do what he had to do I, I never second guess a kid a, a coordinator but I just thought that in this case uh if you had the pregame meal and told the team, if we make one first down, we're going to beat Auburn here in Jordan-Hare Stadium. Everybody would have had an extra case of Gatorade or eating some more pancakes because that's what they'd have wanted. And they had that right on the table for them, and they didn't do anything with it. And I need to congratulate you guys, too, for your bold predictions. Brent, you said Jarrett Garantano would throw for two touchdowns, and darn if he didn't. Two, two, two turnovers, two turnovers. Is that and, what, well, oh, you did have was, two turnovers. Yes, yeah. it was two turn. It was two turnovers. And by the way, back-to-back -back, uh, series that was really sort of a game changer from a momentum standpoint. And then he ended up with the third uh, that Monty picked up and, and scored. A you don't get credit on, so. for it. You just pick two, so you got to pick three for it to be a bold prediction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and coach, that was a good prediction. And coach, uh, you, you said, and, and I'm going to take a little credit too because I was going to say it if you didn't. You said A&M would hang around with Florida, and they hung around and more. Yeah, just a very, very uh, dominating win for them from from an offensive perspective. The way they dominated the defense and. And their defense stepped up and made a couple of plays when they had to have it. But uh, overall, uh, you know, you're looking at A&M now, they're going to be favored in every game they play the rest of the way. They got a chance with Georgia playing Alabama like this. And, uh, you know, who knows? They, they certainly are in the playoff mix right now with their schedule. My bold prediction last week was that Terry Wilson would throw for two touchdowns. That did not happen, but he did throw for one. Uh, a total of 70 yards on the day. That was just a, a – a running attack uh, from Kentucky on Mississippi State with Mike Leach scoring two points as a team, uh, Brent. Yeah, it was phenomenal. And they faced almost, I think, 90 plus, right around 90% plus zone. Uh, people just rushing three, dropping eight, making them dink and dunk and really put the ball in sort of harm's way. And you end up with six interceptions, quarterback change. And now it's a we'll see for the quarterback for them. And going back to the Florida game, we talked a little bit about Florida's defense and just their inability to tackle and just the basics of, and how much and how they led the conference in missed tackles. They had another 18 missed tackles against a uh, and this past weekend. And I remember like one of uh, Spiller's late, the late touchdown run from Spiller just absolutely trucked Ventro Miller in the hole and, you know, another missed tackle, another big play and, and really sort of hurting them. So back to fundamentals, I think for Florida's defense is probably the biggest thing for them. Just to kind of reset uh, who we are, if you're watching us on YouTube, if you're listening on podcast, I'm Dane Young, analyst from UGASports.com. That voice you just heard was Brent Rollins from Pro Football Focus and UGASports.com. And as always, head coach Jim Donnan, College Football Hall of Famer with us. And coach, let's go right into your coach's corner. I know you uh, kind of want to talk about what happens with a big game like we have with Georgia and Alabama and the mentality that goes with that. You know, I learned a lot over the years coaching with different head coaches, assistant coaches, and everything. And uh, you're not going to really 
win the game with the win it for the Gipper talk on Friday night or Saturday morning or Saturday before the game. I mean, your preparation during the week is so essential. And uh, one thing I learned from uh, Coach Switzer was set the tone on Sunday for the game the, the, the next week. And with your entire team, not just your offensive team, we got to do this against their defense or we got to do from a defensive perspective, we got to do this. Everybody on the squad needs to understand the relative strengths and the weaknesses of the other team. And also what your plan is as the head coach to go out and, and get your players ready for, you know, a final exam, so to speak. So basically you got to sell the 70 man travel squad right there from, from the get go that we're going to have preparation all week, like studying for a test. We're going to study the, the material. We're going to practice tests. We're going to do all these things. And then when the game comes, we're going to be ready. And I know all of us, when we go into a test and we feel confident and we're not shaken up and nervous about it, and, and you're going to have a little bit of nerves, but when you know the material, you usually go in there and do pretty well. But when you're prepared uh, in the big games, you're in real trouble. And, uh, and certainly everybody knows the teams are going to prepare, but I'm talking about do the little things, go in and watch a little extra tape, study your guys – uh, uh, your, your own players, see how they're doing things in their preparation. But the big thing is explaining to your team, hey, in this case for Kirby Smart, boy, our offense got to realize that we're not going to be able to just score uh, 10 points and win this game because our defense, if it plays great and has a tremendous game, is going to hold them to 28 or 24 or something like that. And then defensively, uh, you got to understand that you got to create some short fields for our team and uh, special teams and such. So it's a 70-man roster setting the tone on on Sunday and can continue to build up that confidence through Friday. And then uh, Kirby's a master at doing that, and a lot of these coaches are that. The main thing is just let your team know and be straight up with them. Hey, these guys, like in the case of Auburn, I know our team was uh, w wasn't worried about the Auburn team of the past. They were looking at the tape of the Auburn film now, and they knew we had a better team. In the case of Alabama, we know what they are all about, but at the same time, everybody's getting all shot in the butt about uh, Ole Miss's offense. Hey, they scored 31 points and, and had almost 500 yards on Alabama last year. So I think our team just got to go in there and do their thing and hope we can get some field position and, uh, and, and have a chance to get to W. Georgia versus Alabama is our marquee game of the week. And Brent, uh, I didn't even ask you beforehand, but should I just safely assume that your doc's data has something to do with that game? Uh, yes, there's all kinds. There's there's data galore. There's you, you can't even fathom the sort of amount of data that we can look at. But the biggest thing for me is with this game is Georgia's defense, obviously being sort of the you know, number one type defense in the country, Georgia, and then Alabama's offense, because some of the efficiency numbers that Alabama putting, is putting up right now are sort of off the charts good from how efficient they are. When you look at last week against Mississippi, there were 40 yards, like I think 41 yards that they could have gained that they didn't. That was it, the entire game. They scored eight straight, you know, eight straight possessions with touchdowns, and you know, because the they punted on the 40 once and then they fumbled at the one. That, other than that, they scored a touchdown on every drive. So all the yards they could have gotten, they got. But, you know, the playmakers they have on offense, how well Mac Jones is playing at quarterback, the specific numbers that you look at, like from a from a data standpoint, is Florida, Georgia right now is the number one defense in the FBS in terms of run, run defense grade team, team run defense grade. They only have had two missed tackles in the run game. And then with six or less defenders in the box, which you're going to see a lot of that because – Alabama runs a lot of 11 person consistently runs a lot of 11 personnel and spreads teams out. And they have all, for the most part, typically have three receivers who can hurt you. So you're going to see five, six defensive backs on the field a lot. Can you defend the run and limit them in the running game with only six defenders in the box? Georgia's number two in the FD in the FBS in run defense grade with less than six defenders, six or less defenders in the box. So I think that starts because you don't want, if if you let them do both and let them have what they want in the running game, as well as what they're going to get in the passing game, because they're going to get things in the passing game, the receivers and the quarterback are playing too well. If you let them do both, you're going to be in big time trouble to the point where you're looking at, you know, high thirties, forties from them. So that to me, at least is the initial sort of one of the keys, I think for the game from in terms of Georgia's defense versus their offense. 
Coach, with Alabama having such a prolific passing game, but then also having one of the most effective and efficient runners in Najee Harris, but also Robinson. People forget about him because Najee gets the headlines, but it's really a duo with those two. Do you try to make Alabama – I don't want to say one dimensional because I don't even know if that's possible, even for a great defense. But do you try to make them lean heavily on the passing game, hoping for a mistake? You know, one of the things that I think George has, has always done in the Kirby Smart is know yourself, Socrates, know thyself. And I think we we can't worry about Alabama, uh, what they might do and what if and all that stuff. We got to be ourselves and use our identity, which is multiple fronts, multiple coverages, multiple pressures and uh, kind of pick and choose your time to do it. I know that uh, Dane keeps good stats on that. And last week we mixed up the pressures and we mixed up a lot of things on their defense, but, you know, without question, you got to stop the run enough where they just can't uh, play action you to death. You know, we got to get them in some series where they're second and third and long, where we can use our uh, nickel and dime packages to put some pressure on this kid. He's very good at, uh, throwing on time and all, but we got to get him off his mark. I mean, he's, you know, every quarterback when you have to move around in the pocket and, and get uh, vertical or horizontal pressure is not as good. Sometimes they're better than others, but this guy's had a hunky dory year. He really hadn't had any adversity. They've been on cruise control the whole time. The only time he's really had a game where he wasn't was against Auburn last year. And he threw two picks, one, both of them for pick six. And so, we got to get in there and and, uh, and harass him some, and we got to gang tackle Najee. I mean, that's the big deal. But uh, I'm not taking anything away from Alabama, but uh, they haven't exactly played the uh, Chicago Bears defense so far this year against the teams they've been playing against. So uh, they're going to have a lot tougher road to hoe against our defense. Brent, when you and I did the preview for Alabama in the offseason, just about returning players based off PFF grades from last season, one of the guys that stuck out to me is Evan Neal. And how could he not with his size on Alabama's offensive line? George's defensive line more than passed the test against Tennessee, which is in its own right a, a really good offensive line. But this is a whole different animal than what Alabama has. Talk to me a little bit about what you've seen so far this season from Alabama's offensive line in the trenches. You haven't seen the complete and utter domination maybe that you've seen in the past, but when you look at Leatherwood and Neal at tackle and then sort of road graders, Deontay Brown, they got Dickerson on the inside. They're, they're very soft, especially from a talent standpoint. And when you look at like NFL draft type projections and things that, you know, Leatherwood's a first round type caliber player from a talent perspective, Neal will be that uh, in another year because he's a sophomore, but you know, the biggest thing that they do and, and coach talked about this just a second ago, but, Alabama runs play action almost as much as anyone in the country. I think right at 50% or just a slightly less than 50% of Jones's dropbacks right now are off play action. And when you run play action, it helps your offensive line that much more. He's only been pressured on about 20% of dropbacks. Very, that's one of the lower numbers in the nation. So when you do those things, it, it, it helps you know, this whole adage of, you know, sucking linebackers up, giving space, things like that. But as much as anything, it helps the offensive line. And they're, and like I said, they're, they're protecting Jones and he hasn't been under much adversity because of it. And I would add to that, which you've done a good job of explaining before on our previous shows, some of those are actually RPOs where the line doesn't have to worry at all about pass protection. If it's right. a play action pass in the old days, you know, you, you would, you know, your garden tackle on the weak side would have to set and come back and protect. But now with the RPO, they'll fake the ball up inside to Najee and that linebacker plugs, they'll hit the slant right in behind them. And that's, you know, that's a lineman's best friend because coach is not going to get out after him for missing a speed rush or a twist or anything like that. He's blocking the run. So uh, as you mentioned, that's the lineman's best friend, those RPOs, if they work and Alabama's a master at it, that's for sure. Coach, I haven't asked you before, but Steve Sarkeesian at Alabama, do you have any connections to him just from your network or, or know anything about him or have any stories about him? Because he's going to be critical in how he calls this game. You know, I really haven't uh, had anything but respect. Him. I, I don't, I haven't met him because he's a West Coast guy. I don't know a lot of those guys out there personally, but, you know, he's had a really storied career. And a lot of people don't realize when Lane Kiffin got the uh, Raiders job, uh, uh, Al Davis actually tried to interview uh, Sark and offered him the job. Uh, Sark and Lane were co-coordinators there for the 
Southern Cal Trojans, and when they really had that high, that long run along with uh, Norm Chow before, and then Chow left. But uh, you know, he's a really master of the West Coast offense. He knows a lot about it, and uh, a good game man. And I wouldn't say manager, but a really in-game type coach that is going to have that extra burden a little bit of being the head coach, but. He's, he certainly has a lot of uh, experience coaching at Washington and at Southern California. So it's not like this is his first uh, rodeo, but, uh, but I think it's certainly going to be so much attention paid to the fact that Nick's not there and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, it boils down to players. I mean, uh, usually uh, the, the play calls are, are set through the quarterback more than anybody. Uh, uh, Brent would tell you that, you put so much on the quarterback's plate as far as checking plays off, RPOs, all that. So, uh, really, uh, which one of these quarterbacks makes the least mistakes in this game? I think that team will win because as much as I'm high on Mac Jones, I miss high on Stetson Bennett, and I think he can play a prominent role in this game, maybe even more than Jones because he can make a lot of things happen with his feet. Uh, they do uh, an inordinate amount of playing man coverage, a lot of man under. And if he breaks the line of scrimmage with no run support, he can make a lot of yards in this game. And and certainly people that listened to your podcast on Tuesday along with Roddy, you brought up the fact that the last four losses for Alabama, the, the opposing quarterback that won the game had close to 50 yards rushing. So we could see that in this game. Uh, we could see that out of Stetson Bennett. And Brent, it's it's that, but it's also that the quarterbacks in those games, so we're talking Joe Burrow, Trevor Lawrence, Bo Nix, and uh, Jarrett Stidham, they all had around 50, 60 yards rushing, but they also had zero turnovers. So it's playing a clean game, but also being able to extend plays or even run uh, for easy yardage. Stetson Bennett, we've seen that from him. We've seen him run for a touchdown against Tennessee. We've seen him uh, escape the pocket quickly and scramble do you think that he can be a running threat against Alabama's defense? Very much so. And it's something I think you haven't really seen a whole lot of, but when he's done it, he's done it successfully. And I think you have to do that in this game. You just have to. And there's certain things, because as much as anything, a lot of times with a, with quarterback play, hey, you know, let's get him an easy completion to start. Sometimes that's just a run, hey, run, get hit. Now I'm in the flow of the game, all that sort of energy and and – Adrenaline is gone and settles them down a little bit. But I think there's two things specifically that Georgia's offense can do this week that will help them, one, be successful, and then, two, try to put more and more points on the board on, on a consistent basis. And that is, one, moving George Pickens around. We see him, like I think it's like 90-something percent of his snaps have been on the outside. I love, would love to see him in the slot some, in the backfield, just wherever kind of like what LSU did uh, with Jamar Chase last year and moving him around wherever just to get him in some one-on-one matchups and, and doing things like that. But also using play action like Alabama does and attacking early uh, on early downs on first and second down. Alabama's linebackers are some of the worst in coverage in the conference. And even like if you watch the, the very end of the Ole Miss game, the very end when they're down like 15 or whatever it was that they were down, Third and eight, last play, one of the last plays they run, they run play action still, and linebackers are right at the line of scrimmage and being thrown right over top of in a game, late game situation where you know they're going to throw. So I think those two things, along with using stats and legs, that's if Georgia does that, I think they're going to have consistent success against Alabama's defense. Coach, that, that leads to a guy that you've been talking about is Trey McKitty because he's going to be one of the guys those linebackers will be covering uh, and the matchups that Georgia's tight ends can create with McKitty and Washington and um, John Fitzpatrick. You know, that seems like a spot that Stetson Bennett has found some comfort in. Have you seen that from Georgia's tight ends? Yeah, I really think that's a, it's going to be expanded role for him and also, uh, if you look at the stats in that game, uh, Sertan and uh, uh, and uh, did a good – and the other corner did a pretty good job of set, stopping the wide receivers for uh, Ole Miss. But, uh, you know, over 300 yards to the backs and tight ends in that game. Just unbelievable how much they utilize those guys. Uh, and, and Brent points that out. You know, we used to – against five man, which is too, too deep, five man under. Everybody has a, a man. The corners have the outside receivers. The uh, Sam linebacker has a tight end. The Mike has the fullback, and the Will has the running back. But 
now it's a one back set. But we used to uh, always try to work on the on the weakest linebacker with either our tight end or either one of the backs, and uh, has typical kind of option routes. And we saw it last week with Kenny McIntosh against Alabama um, against uh, Tennessee, where he ran an angle route. He came out of the backfield on their linebacker and broke it back underneath him, under man under, and, and he was just wide open. This week we have that advantage. Hopefully, uh, this guy's about 12 months pregnant, James Cook. If he can just stay healthy, I really think he's going to be a tremendous advantage in this game. McIntosh is good out of the backfield, but uh, James Cook is just a wonder kind type of guy back there that I think could really explode against their linebackers. And and Brent certainly pointed that out. Most linebackers are a lot better against the run than they are the pass. There's not a lot of guys like Roquan Smith out there that can play a guy down the field 30 yards. So, I mean, We'll, we'll certainly see them try to attack our backers, too. I mean, that's just the way teams use. I mean, that's why a guy's a linebacker instead of a strong safety. Brett, I, I know you wanted to mention uh, something else about Alabama's offense that you've seen. Yeah, and it's – it's and Coach talks about just how, how hard it is to cover those guys out of the backfield. How hard is it to make throws when players are open? 69% of Jones uh, – Mac Jones's attempts – to are to an open wide open or receiver with a step. So Georgia though plays man to man as well as anyone in the country with, with Campbell Stokes, you got Webb and Stevenson on the inside, Dan, DJ Daniel in there as well. They're 22% sex, success rate against their man to man defense is one of the lowest numbers in the country. That's one of the lowest efficiency numbers you're going to look at for any play. So Alabama's receivers and then Georgia's man to man defense and how much they create sort of, some hectic play within there as opposed to Mac Jones throwing to traditional open receivers, get him off balance, get him a little bit in, in his head. That's one way to sort of hopefully succeed. But it, this game, it's just, it's a, such a beautiful game. And even coach, you know, when you know that there's a slight possibility or not slight, but a relatively decent possibility, you might play this team again at the end of the season. Is there anything you're holding in your back pocket, or is it, or is this a kitchen sink type game for you? Yeah, this is a sell the ranch, butcher knife bandit. Anything you can do to win the game, because too many variables here. We looked at, we look around the country. Thirty games now postponed because of COVID. Two within our own conference this week. One today with Cincinnati and Tulsa. So. Uh, who knows if you'll even play a championship game? I mean, hopefully we will. And uh, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, you know, people are worried about Coach Coach Saban not coaching. No, I'm worried about his health. I mean, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's very – he's a mentor to Coach Smart and a lot of people. And the guy's 68 years old. I mean, uh, he's not infallible. I mean, you got to be careful here. I mean, this is a, a devastating type of disease. And I just hope even though supposedly he's asymptomatic, that uh, the major deal here is his health. He can return to his health first before he starts worrying about coaching again. I loved what he said too. He said, you know, I, you have the concerns about your family and I definitely have those. Uh, my second concern is I want my players to have a chance to be able to play. Um, and I thought that was just, it shows how much he cares about them. Um, and, and like you said, we've seen a couple games canceled, canceled on the SEC and we'll see what that goes from there. I want to mention this in the chat. Uh, Chuck Ward commented and said that uh, on the newsstand yesterday morning in Ames, Iowa was a full color picture of Stetson Bennett with an article about the game. That's pretty cool for a guy like Stetson and his background. And, and trust me, if he finds a way to beat Alabama, that's a household name. Uh, that's just what happens in a game like that. So uh, it's going to be fun. I, I hope everyone savors it uh, and has a good time with that game. We do have other games on the docket that we need to get to. Um, so that's our marquee game. We've got four others. Let's go Auburn, South Carolina. Uh, Coach, this is going to be an early kickoff over in Columbia. Can Gus Malzahn find whatever magic that they did to pull out the win against Arkansas yet again? I think they're going to have a hard time with this South Carolina team because they're very good at running the ball. And this Harris kid uh, is just having a big year for him out of the backfield, uh, catching the ball, running the ball. They don't have the wide outs that, uh, that, they, that we've seen that, that have hurt Auburn this year. But uh, And then defensively, a really good third down team that gets people off the field. So uh, 
uh, you know, even though Bigsby's starting to come on, I mean, I think uh, they've got a little bit better defense, maybe personnel, particularly up front than uh, Arkansas. So, uh, and all of a sudden, uh, South Carolina's got a little bit of swagger about them. You know, even though they did beat Vandy, they got the win. They playing at home. They see the Auburn team on t- tape that's maybe not the one they thought they were going to be playing back in August. So, uh, I got to see. I'd be surprised if uh, Auburn wins this game. The only way they're going to win it is to create some offensive field position that that will help their offense get some scores. I, otherwise, I think South Carolina, to me, I, I think it'd be upset if Auburn beats them. Brent, you got to watch out for these noon home games uh, for the road team. That's where the upsets tend to happen in college football, really any year, but I've seen it a lot this year. That's what Florida fell victim to against A&M. Are you with coach thinking that it may go South Carolina's way? Very much so. Like to me, this is a complete flip a coin pick game. When you add in the the noon sort of road game element. Now I will say, like coach said, if you like running backs, this is the game for you. Kevin Harris at South Carolina, Tank Bigsby at, at Auburn, who is, sort of already proving to be how good he is as a, as a true freshman and, and what he's going to become. And I think you're going to see him kind of be a leader in the conference very much so uh, early on in his career and then for the next few years. But Bo Nix has not played well. And he's, you know, he, it's got to turn around for him at some point or they're going to end up a 500 or worse team at best. And I, 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 I'm very much like Coach him leaning in, into the South Carolina Gamecock way at this point in time. Just you know, to make sure in, in this game at South Carolina. It is. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You know, the other thing is Auburn's oh, offensive team, line. Road team upsets. I, I wasn't sure what you meant there. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'm saying that uh, when it's uh, pretty much when you're a favorite on the road at noon, uh, it's easy to get that underdog upset. Now, I don't know what the line is for that game. Three. 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 Well. Auburn three. Just, Auburn minus three. That's not much of an upset, but it would still be an upset nonetheless. Look, until Auburn gets its offensive line figured out, and that may take another recruiting class or another season, based on what I've seen, it's just going to be a tough road to hoe. Uh, With an offensive line playing musical chairs this far into a season, that's no good. That's not going to get it done. for Even with Tank Bixby emerging, who's making a lot of linemen look a little bit better than they actually are, because that kid is special. Um Let's go over to Kentucky at Tennessee because this is one of the more intriguing games in the country to me. Brent, I'll start with you. Kentucky gets a little bit of confidence with a uh, win over Mississippi State. Uh, But Tennessee, you know, has a little bit more going on, I think, uh, with its lines of scrimmage. But then also an experienced quarterback who we saw good Garantano and bad Garantano. Very much so. And and I think in the end, which quarterback makes plays and or makes mistakes is who wins this game because I think the rest of the – rosters are relatively equal and you know when you look at Kentucky yes they're having they have momentum they only had 157 yards of offense last week it was amazing there was I think there was six almost 16 15 or 16 punts in that game you know in addition to all the turnovers it was an offensive albatross in uh, in a way but I do think I actually think Kentucky actually goes on the road here plays well I think Wilson plays better than Garantano and I think they actually get the victory oh wow coach what are you thinking with Tennessee and Kentucky you know, this uh, Kentucky has had a hard time against Tennessee over the last 10 years. I mean, that's just been a game that they just can't win very often. And uh, like you, we were talking about, uh, the, the, they got all those yards and lost the game the first two. And then last week, they didn't get hardly any and won. So there's got to be a happy medium there. They're going to have to generate some offense because I think Tennessee is uh, probably – you know, the best offensive team they play. Maybe Ole Miss might be a little bit better, but uh, but I think Tennessee has the capabilities of hurting you in a lot of different ways. It's just hard to gauge Tennessee against Georgia because Georgia's defense swarmed them so much. Uh, they're going to need some of those fade routes against Kentucky, uh, easy scores that were really perfectly thrown balls in that game. But uh, I just feel like Tennessee, uh, if they're going to be a contender – this team right here, Kentucky, it's a toss-up between these two teams. Who's the next best team in the league after Florida uh, and, of course, Georgia and, and, and the SEC East. So you got to beat your, your big-time opponents like that because down the road, uh, still tough schedule for Tennessee. you got to play Alabama. You know, it's, uh, I think they still got to play uh, TC, uh, Texas A&M and Auburn. So 
uh, they, they got to get this W. And I think Tennessee has to reestablish the running game. I know it's hard against Georgia, so I'm not being too critical of that. But Tennessee's not going anywhere if it cannot run the ball. And so if they can find a way to, to get Eric Gray in open space against Kentucky, I, I think it may lean a little bit more Tennessee's way, but it's an intriguing matchup to me. Let's go over to Ole Miss at Arkansas. Yet another intriguing SEC matchup with two teams that I, I think are quite unpredictable. I mean, I, well, maybe Ole Miss is more predictable where the offense can score and the defense can't stop anyone from scoring. Um, but Arkansas just kind of hanging tough, Brent. Here comes Sam Pittman uh, in, in every game that Arkansas hasn't been in in two years. I mean, that's they've done a phenomenal job already. I think the marriage of Kendall Brown's offense with Felipe Franks is actually best suited for his skill set because it's a lot of it's deep ball shots. It's over 50 percent play action. He has the, the number one use of play action in the, in the conference. And then it's, you know, sort of layups and bubbles and things of that nature that it's either one or the other. And that's what he's really good. He's actually playing really well. He has. Only two turnover-worthy plays in three games. And by the way, he's not playing terrible defenses. He's played Georgia and, and you know, and some of the, you know, sort of not easy, easy defenses in the conference. But, you know, him and he's – I think he's completing right, right at 78% adjusted completion percentage when you th- factor in drops. So, Franks is actually playing really well. But more than anything, this game should just be fun. Like, when you, when you have Ole Miss and the way they play offense – and as bad as their defense is, this is just fun to watch. You, you, you know, you're going to sit down for four hours and you're going to see action. You're, it's not going to be punts like Kentucky and Mississippi State. It's going to be up and down the field, playmaking, you know, and sort of a showcase of ability. So it, by all means, it'll be fun and, and see. But, hey, Sam Pittman is doing a very good job. They've got coordinators that are doing very successful things already in a very short time. So it's going to be a fun game to watch as much as anything. And coach, if after week one, KJ Costello had all the stock in the SEC as far as quarterbacks go, it seems like a lot of that stock has moved over to Matt Corral after that performance against Alabama. He's getting a lot of praise nationally, and for good reason. He's a playmaker. Yeah, I thought the thing that impressed me the other night was the way he moved around the pocket and extended plays, uh, kept the drives along, uh, you know, with the first downs when it looked like they might be off the field. And Certainly, when they, when the other team's scoring at a rate like Alabama was to do that, and they, the the fast pace that they utilized certainly called Alabama off kilter a little bit for sure because you could see them misaligned at several times and just uh, as we were talking about early, a lot of missed tackles and that happens when a team's tired and they're gassed, they're gonna miss open field plays. But they got some special players. I mean, when you look at receiver and then the running back I mean they, they really have some skill set that not many teams in the country have and you got to give which Luke and his staff credit for recruiting them basically the same team that they had from last year offensively but switch quarterbacks from uh to Corral but I, I really am impressed with Corral's uh management of the game the way he uh, shows his athleticism, and he certainly got the big arm. Everybody knew that. I mean, he was a very highly recruited guy. On the concept of Arkansas, uh, they're doing what they can with who, who they have. Odom's doing a good job with their defense. Uh, they've been in every game, and I expect them to be in. I would think, even though they're going to have a a small crowd compared to the sellout that they have, there's going to be a lot of who pig in this game because these fans are – desperate for a win i think they they haven't had a win at home since uh truman was president i think it's been a long time <laughs> in the sec i mean they've got some kind of sec record for lost games in a row for uh, sec losses so uh but you know this is this year's team and they've already quelled a lot of that with the win over mississippi state uh, the great job against auburn last week so uh the fans got to feel like that uh, sam pitt their man and they got a lot to look forward to and then we go to texas a&m going to mississippi state coach mike leach i mean i I don't know what you say after the start they had against lsu the wheels have fallen off and uh, he's trying to find some answers uh in starkville you know the the real thing about that offense is either uh you know the teams can really defend them or they can't and uh, we saw both teams the last two weeks drop eight and make them throw the ball in front of them and they're throwing a lot of interceptions. I mean, you got to be as many as anybody in the country right now. And uh, Costello went from a Heisman Trophy uh, type guy uh, the first week to two weeks of, you know, being uh, 
you know, just kind of chastised about all the, the different uh, interceptions. But I think the, the big thing in this game is a and how are you going to handle success? Everybody's been waiting for you to do well. They've been talking about you can't beat a top, beat a top 10 team. Uh, you always lose the close games, all that. So everybody's patting them on the back and telling them, like even me, saying that they got the easiest role to get in, uh, a nine and one record with their, they're going to be favored every game, uh, along with Alabama and uh, and Georgia's not favored in this game, but will be favored in the rest of them. But looks like LSU's not anywhere near what we thought they'd be. But I just think if they can continue to, uh, we keep talking about can Mon perform on the level that he did last week and be consistent and and not throw the picks. Uh, this should be a, a win for him. But a lot of things happen crazy over there in Starkville, and uh, you, you just never know. But I, I look for A&M to take this one. Brent, do you think that last week was kind of a statement game for A&M to turn things around under Jimbo Fisher? I mean, very much so. And especially like Coach said, their schedule moving forward. If LSU at home, they go to Tennessee, they go to Auburn. Outside of that, they're going to be – decent chunk favorites in every other game. Two things. One, Mon played a, one of his better games of his career from a clean pocket. He had an 87.6 grade from a clean pocket, three touchdowns, no picks. But the what's going to be interesting, a big, big loss for them was the Caleb Chapman injury. I mean, he's become a big-time target for them, you know, throwing jump balls to, you know, great touchdown catch in traffic uh, in, in the Florida game, out for the year with, with, a, with a knee and – you, know, you already lost a couple receivers to graduation. And then you already lost what you thought was going to be your best receiver to opting out. So can they have some playmakers on the outside? The tight end is obviously – and Weidermeyer is still going to be heavily involved. And Nia Smith, Nia Smith, however you say it, is going to be heavily involved out of the backfield as a receiver. Can you still find playmakers and, and generate points on the outside? And if you can, their running game is going to be really good. Isaiah Spiller had one of the best games of the week last week and, and – forced I think double digit missed tackles against Florida so if they can find that playmaker on the outside they're gonna their schedule lines up very very nice for them and they're gonna be okay coach it seems like with the conference that at the top Georgia and Alabama maybe one or two other teams at the bottom obviously Vanderbilt maybe another team or two but there's this clump of about eight teams in the middle of the conference that I feel like they could beat each other on any given day based on how they've performed so far this season have you seen that from those teams kind of in the middle too yeah, no question. I mean, uh, you can shake them up all in the box and put different uniforms on different coaches. Each coach coach a different team. I mean, they're so so close. It's unbelievable. Uh, just and you're a block punt or a tip pass or a missed assignment away from a, a win or a loss. And so many of those games, you're gonna have a lot of toss up games here down the stretch. Well, uh, speaking of toss-up games, it's time for us to toss up and make our picks. Uh, so far on the season, we pick three games each week. I am eight and one, so thank you, Kentucky, for coming through for me after they uh, hurt you guys so bad the first two weeks. You're both six and three. We all went three and zero oh last week, so we will start with Kentucky and Tennessee. Brent, cats. I, I, I actually, I think they win. I think they're they're sort like Coach said. I think they're going to find a happy medium of offensive efficiency, and some playmaking, and I think they get the victory. Coach? I'm going to have to go with the Vols here. Uh, based on just the history of the game, uh, I think the Vols, this is a really a big time for their uh, situation for them because everybody wants them to be good. If you're going to get over the hump in the East, you got to beat, you got to win this game. If you, if you lose this game, it's going to be here we go again. Uh, it's going to be the same old song up there. The eight-game winning streak that Tennessee had, Tennessee got by winning games like this. So I'm going to take Tennessee, but apprehensively a little bit because I do think Kentucky is slowly kind of getting some things figured out. I'm just too worried about the quarterback play at Kentucky. And until that shows different, I just that's going to be a Jekyll and Hyde team for and sure. We're going to catch you. i got to find ways to catch you here. i got to go against the green. There you go. Um, so, Brent, I'll let you pick here. Do you want to pick Auburn at South Carolina or do you want to pick Ole Miss at Arkansas? I it really I flip, flip a coin because I'm 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 going I'm going with the home team in either in either game. All right, well then let's go Auburn South Carolina. That that's what I originally had selected here. Uh, so you're going to go with South Carolina. Yes, going with the Gamecocks early noon game. Think think they're just going to make plays. I think Harris is going to make plays uh, running back, and and they're going to be just enough to win that sort of coin flip game right at the end. 
Coach, it sounded like you're doing the same. Yeah, I mean, uh, Chad Morris hadn't had a very good record there in that stadium. He's one and three against South Carolina lifetime anyhow uh, when he was at Clemson. So uh, I'm going to go with the Gamecocks just because of their line of scrimmage. I think they just got uh, a lot better defensive line and their offense should be able to move the ball on uh, Auburn's defense. I'm going with the, with the game, Cox. You guys zig. I'm going to zag. I'm going to take Auburn, and I really don't have a good reason why other than <laughs> I'm really impressed with Tank Bixby because I am not impressed with the offense as a whole. Uh, so maybe Tank runs for uh, 200 yards or something and, and just has one of those legendary SEC games. And then finally, guys, we've got Georgia Bama, our marquee game of the week. Uh, Coach, I guess I'll start with you. I mean, seriously, what would happen to me if I picked Alabama? <laughs> That's why I went to you first. Not that I would, but, uh, you know, I feel good about Georgia's chances in this game. I, I like it, regardless if Nick is coaching the game or not. I just feel like our def- – anytime you got a defense like our capabilities are, I mean, certainly playing one of the best offenses uh, so far that you've seen in a long time. But, uh, you know, they haven't gone up any against anybody like a – I just feel like uh, Georgia will get its share of offensive yards and got a big advantage in the kicking game, although I worry about punting the ball because our punter punts it so far that Wadley can, uh, you know, maybe get some uh, some returns on it. So uh, uh, I, I like it, Georgia in the game. Brent? When you look at Alabama right now, they're scoring at about on a 70% clip in terms of the drive, the offensive drives they get they're probably going to get about 10, 11 drives this game. So if they, if that clip, if that holds, can you limit some of those scoring opportunities to field goals or can you limit the ability for them to, to score and, and have any sort of scoring drives? You got to get turnovers. You got to get, I think you have to obviously win the turnover battle. That goes without saying, I still think they're all in, at the end of the day. This is one of those things where offense is going, you know, the whole adage of defense wins champions. I think, that is not football in 2020. I think offense wins, and I think they will score just you know too much, just slightly too much. I think it's a you know 31 type, 31 to 24 type game. It's 34 to 24, you know 34 to 27, something of that nature. But I just think offensively they too much for them. And I think I would agree with you. Other than Georgia's defense has shown the ability to score points. And when Auburn beat Mac Jones in Alabama last year, Mac Jones threw two pick sixes. So I think Georgia's defense is going to be scoring 14 points, something like that. And that's going to go a long way into helping Georgia get this win in Tuscaloosa. I just think the defense is special. I think it's on the borderline of being legendary. And so far, mostly injury-free. I know there's been some some nicks. I know Jermaine Johnson's probably coming back. We, we're hearing some stuff on uh, some of the other players with just minor injuries. Georgia seems healthy, and that's what you wanted going into Alabama. I'm taking the dogs here. Brent? I was going to say, two two more last points. When you think about defense against offense, you played LSU. You just played LSU last year in the SEC championship game. What's the difference? One, Jones is not Joe Burrow from an athletic standpoint, and he's not going to make the plays with his feet that Burrow made against Georgia's defense. And two, Alabama rarely runs empty with no backs in the backfield and just a QB that causes so much conflict on the defense and just destroyed Georgia last year in the SEC championship game. Those are two things that won't exist in this game. And I think that if you're looking for sort of silver linings for Georgia's defense and where they can have success is those two things not existing. That's a good point. Let's wrap with our bold predictions guys and get out of here. So uh, I'm going to give you mine first. I think Tank Bixby is going to lead the league in rushing this week. And I don't know if that's that bold of a prediction right now, based on how he's been performing for two weeks. Uh, But I'm going to say Tank Bixby leads the SEC in rushing. What do you have for me, Brent? Felipe Franks outplays Matt Corral. Ooh. That's bold. I think higher grade Arkansas sort of right there. Borderline wins the game and he outplays him. That, that you know, we got to be bold, right? It says bold prediction. So that's my bold prediction for the week. You have one for me, coach. Yeah, I'll say one team's going to return a punt for a touchdown in this Alabama game. It's either going to be uh, Waddle with taking one back or uh, our guy, Kiaris Jackson. I think one team's going to return a punt for a touchdown. 
Well, a lot of NFL eyes will be on that game among many in the SEC. This has been Around the League from UGASports.com. Uh, guys, always a pleasure to do this, and I look forward to chatting with you guys next week. For Brent Rollins and head coach Jim Donnan, I'm Dane Young. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next week.